Hey, it's NPR's Book of the Day. I'm Andrew Limbong. When people talk about generational trauma, I sometimes feel like they're talking about two related but kind of different things. There's the type that's like, my great-grandpa messed up my grandpa who messed up my dad who messed me up. And then there's a version that goes, some major historical, likely horrific event happened generations ago, and I still bear the scars of that. Today, we've got two books that deal with different sides of this, and they both happen to take place in India. In a bit, we'll hear from the author of the book, Mirror Made of Rain, who says that when her book first came out in India, the main character incited so much anger that critics wrote that they wished they could physically assault her. It's wild. But first, Anjali and Jetty's book, The Parted Earth, deals with the partition of the Indian subcontinent by British colonizers into the majority Muslim Pakistan and the majority Hindu India, triggering the largest migration in human history. And Jetty talked to NPR Steve Inskeep about how violent it was and how it still affects people today. You'll hear her start off the interview. So when Pakistan was formed, it was East Pakistan, which became Bangladesh, and, and West Pakistan, which is on the northwest part of the subcontinent. So people who have roots in those areas do have these stories. Um, of course, not everybody is wanting to talk about those stories, right? There was significant amounts of trauma uh, in the form of deaths, in the form of Uh, sexual violence, particularly against women, in the form of simply families having to uproot their entire lives and leave behind all of their uh, belongings and their ancestral homes and move to a part of the subcontinent that was unfamiliar with them. So this is something that affects millions of people. I mean, when we talk about the fact that 15 million migrated and we think about the number of descendants. We're talking about millions and millions of people. You said trauma. I want to introduce the phrase generational trauma, because it seems to me here you write not only about 1947, but about a woman in America in much closer to the present time who is somehow affected by that partition story, even though she doesn't quite know it. Absolutely. So the novel does take place over 70 years, And the grandmother and granddaughter who are at the center of the novel are actually estranged. And their estrangement is actually rooted in the grandmother's trauma from 1947. And it was really important for me to show how trauma is not something that's finite. It's not something that happens to one person. It happens to an entire community. It happens to an entire generation. And it is something that gets inherited in some form. So what is the trauma suffered then by Deepa, who is one of your main characters, a very young woman in 1947 in India? She is 16 years old, and she essentially loses the folks closest to her that she loves. On top of that, she eventually loses her home that holds all of the memories she has of them. She is transported to the United Kingdom, uh, where she ends up uh, living most of the rest of her life. Um, And so she is cut off from everything. She is cut off from family. She is cut off from someone she loves dearly. She is cut off from her homeland, her history, all the memories, essentially, that she has of her childhood. And how does that affect her descendants, whether they know the story or not? Deepa is a character who is not able to process her trauma. So when she raises her own child, she is not really able to talk about her family. She is not even able to share the identity of his father. And so her son, whose name is Vijay, ends up trying to figure out his history, trying to go on his own quest to connect with his family. And it's a quest that he's not able to complete. So Sean Johnson, the granddaughter, who is essentially uh, who the novel revolves around, she is trying to complete what her father started. And it's only after she experiences her own personal tragedies that she decides to go on this quest herself. Why does that past matter, do you think, to people living today? Our ancestrals' pasts really shape our identities. They shape our views of the world. They shape our understanding of ourselves. And we are lost without them. They are our foundation 
Um, and, and if we don't have this knowledge of our histories, of our ancestors, of what they endured, it's really hard to understand our own self-concept. When we peel back the layers of this story to get back to 1947, we find that Deepa, we should note, was Hindu, a Hindu girl, 16 years old, who was in love with a Muslim boy. Why, as a novelist, was it important to you to put a Hindu together with a Muslim in 1947? So, you know, despite the fact that there was a lot of violence between Hindus and Muslims, we have to remember that Hindus and Muslims have a history of living together peacefully. And in fact, even during such strife of partition, there were Muslims who were helping their Hindu and Sikh neighbors. There were Hindus and Sikhs who were helping their Muslim neighbors. They were hiding them. They were, they were holding their possessions for them. They were familial type relationships among these different faiths. Um, it's not like overnight, suddenly these religious groups hated one another. They were in fact in community with one another fairly peacefully. Um, it was really partition that destroyed a lot of these relationships, but all along they were also helping one another. Did you find in partition some concrete lesson for now, uh, looking back at that tragedy? One of the most surprising things I learned about when I was doing the research about partition and just reading was that it wasn't until this century that there was a formal widespread effort to collect survivors' stories of partition. It didn't really happen until 60 years later, 6-0, and of course, during those decades, when there was not a major effort to collect stories, some of these stories would have been lost. So if there is one main lesson to draw from writing this book, it is how important it is for us to find places for our family members to share their stories. They might not want to share them with us, but to find a way to encourage them to write down what happened to them or to record on their voice recorder on their iPhone what happened to them, to ask them, what was your childhood like? We will all find out stories that we had no idea existed from our older family members if we simply just ask them. Anjali Jetty is the author of the novel The Parted Earth. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Nahid Faroz Patel's Mirror Made of Rain examines the more personal avenue of generational trauma, but in an empathetic way. In this interview with NPR's Leila Fadl, Patel makes this point about how we treat mothers who are quote-unquote failures and how lonely it can be to be a so-called failed mother. Indian author Nahid Faroz Patel says she's always been drawn to unlikable characters. So it's not surprising that Numi, the strong-willed protagonist of her novel Mirror Made of Rain, is rude, angry, and straight-up self-destructive at times. Numi grows up in a high society circle in India. Her parents' friends are high-powered lawyers and business tycoons, and invitations to parties are telling of whether you are in or out with her city's most wealthy and influential. The novel is a coming-of-age story about a woman raised by a mother struggling with addiction and an absentee father, all in a social circle where women have to hide their vices, their pains, and the wrongs committed against them. For Patel, Numi is an emotionally conflicted character. So Numi is a young woman who grows up in this, I would say, upper middle class uh, Indian family. And her family is ostensibly very modern, like, you know, the women are allowed to drink and all that stuff. But she has a mother who has not had the support that she needed uh, for her mental health. And the mother passes down that trauma to her daughter as like almost like an inheritance. And it's about Numi kind of navigating this really constricting social structure of small town conservative India and how she kind of tries or fails to break free of that mold. And it's also about how, you know, a person like Numi is really like, encouraged all the time to look at herself through the eyes of people watching her because yeah. like you know in, in India and I'm sure in other places as well we have this phrase lo kya kahenge which is basically what will people say and that's such a determinant factor for I think a lot of young women growing up in India and elsewhere yeah 
you talk about the relationship between Numi and her mother. And in the book, her mother is is struggling with addiction, serious addiction that impacts Numi's life, impacts Numi's father's life. They're living in a multi-generational home. And this inheritance, it fascinates me the way that all of what she resents in her mother is something that Numi begins to become. Can you talk about that relationship? Yeah, so I think one of the questions I really wanted to explore in the book was um, how to mother when there's a vacuum of support and Mm. a vacuum of care. And I think that Numi's mother is left to the wolves in, in in a sense that she's not provided with the support that she needs from her family and from from society in general to be an adequate or a good mother to Numi. Um, I think the novel kind of explores that, uh, what does the failure to mother mean? And why is it such a lonely failure? Like, I feel like, you know, mm-hmm. when when men fail at parenthood, like society steps into help. There's a lot more empathy. But when a, you know, when a mother fails, she kind of fails all by herself. Mm. Um and, you know, Numi, you know, she blames her mother for everything. She kind of joins in, in not like having any empathy for her mother, but she is in a way slowly turning into her mother. And yeah, the, I felt like that was the most natural, organic way to write this relationship. Now, we're speaking at a time that your book is being released here in the US, but this book is already out in India. And I'm curious just how it was received, because it's not uncontroversial topics that you wrote about. <laughs> Um, I was actually really surprised, pleasantly surprised at how well it was received. But there was also like, definitely there was a like a, a really wide diversity of opinion about the book, which was also interesting to me because some people just really, really did not like Numi. And they felt so angry uh, at her that they wrote in their reviews that they would like to physically assault her. Oh my gosh. Which I thought was, yes. And this is, these were written by women. Hmm. Um, so uh, I thought that was incredibly interesting because I think that kind of, um, my analysis is that Numi kind of evoked a lot of internalized misogyny. And I I, I found it really interesting to see it kind of come to the front or bubble up to the surface in that way. Now, your book tackles some pretty tough topics, addiction, rape, shame women are brought up with. In this case, it's in India, but I'm sure women reading this will relate from their own cultures. I definitely know that I did. But these are often topics that aren't tackled head on. And yet in your novel, they're front and center. Why did you choose to tackle such difficult storylines? And and what do you want the reader to walk away with? I think that the answer is kind of in the in the title because you know when we were uh, discussing you know possible titles and we saw that mirrors play a huge role in in the book and how numi perceives herself and how society in- encourages us to perceive ourselves through the eyes of others um i wanted a reader to sit with somebody who is not like them at all and still like identify or feel their pain or feel their joy you know I felt like this book is something that I could write best. And I I felt like it was something that needs to be written. Let me ask about that. You said it's a story that needed to be told. Why did it need to be told? Because I think that when we talk about patriarchy um, or we talk about, you know, the rights of women or the state of women in India, we think of the bigger, like the more ostensibly horrific things, right? Like dowries or, you know, all, all sorts of things that, that are going on that capture the headlines. But there are these small, everyday violences that occur to women, um, which nobody really talks about. And these small microaggressions and this the way that, you know, society fails women in a very subtle, very under, like, a, like an undercurrent of patriarchy. And I noticed that, and I couldn't stop noticing it. Um, for example, the way society treats female addicts over men, uh, the the extent that um, women's anger, and Numi is a really angry character, and I think her mother is also a very angry person. Um, the way that uh, women's anger is pathologized and it's kind of negated, while the anger of men to a large extent is kind of mythologized and it's, it's, you know, it's deemed righteous. Yeah. 
Nahid Feroz Patel is the author of Mirror Made of Rain. Thank you so much for speaking with us. I appreciate it. Thank you. That's it for this week on NPR's Book of the Day. Let us know what you think. You can write to us at bookoftheday at npr.org. I'm Andrew Limbong. The podcast is produced by Miranda Mazariegos and edited by Megan Sullivan. Our founding editor is Petra Mayer. The show's elements for this week were produced and edited by Lauren Magaki, Shannon Rhodes, Jeevika Verma, Rena Advani, Elena Burnett, Brianna Scott, and Courtney Dorning. Beth Donovan is our managing editor. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.